Good evening, and the harvest is ready, and the church is ready, and it's good to be here tonight. Uh, Brother Ralph going to bring the message in just a little bit here, but uh, before he does, I have a few announcements. I have a few things I want to tell you about. As the song there says, uh, uh, the times and the times we're in right now, there's a harvest and it's time to get to work. I'm excited. I want to read some scripture to you and I'm going to tell you about something we're going to be doing. A very familiar scripture, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. But those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles and they will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. That's exactly what it is. Those that wait upon the Lord, the Lord will answer those prayers. The Lord will take care of those situations. And I have been praying. I'm sure those of you have been praying. And I have some exciting news. As you know, for the last couple of weeks, we've been opened. We've opened up our sanctuary for our worship service from 11 to whenever. Well, I'm excited to tell you that this coming Sunday morning, we will be having Sunday school. And our Sunday school will have the kids will be down, the small kids will be down with Mariah and Kayla and, and the older kids with Brother Ralph and Brother Scott will have them up top here. And we will start our Sunday school at 10 o'clock and then our worship service at 11. So come and be part of that with us. Come and be with us and join in on that. Excited about what the Lord's going to do. We're looking forward to this summer. We're looking forward to what uh, what he has in store for us. Last year was a big summer for us. We had a big time of vacation Bible school. Uh, remember those days. Remember those times. Of what happened last year. Let's get to work. And let's believe in the Lord. Let's uh, watch what he's going to do for us. And we've been praying for this day to where we could get back in church. And that time has come. So let's go to the Lord in prayer before Brother Ralph gets up here. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, Lord, I thank you for your power and your strength and your wisdom and your knowledge. I thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to stand tonight and say that, Lord, I know you as my personal Savior. And, Lord, I know that if there is someone out there that does not know you as Lord and Savior, that if they will believe in you and believe upon the name of Jesus Christ and accept you as Lord and Savior, they will be reunited with the King of Kings. Lord, they will be with you, and Lord, they will have that peace and that comfort that only you can give. And that's my prayer tonight. And I pray for someone out there that, Lord, they're suffering through something, whatever it might be, a physical need, a spiritual need, Lord. And, Lord, we have those in our church that are recovering. Brother John Oxford, Lord, is recovering from surgery. Uh, and Pam... Styles is recovering from surgery, Lord, and I pray that you just continue to work in their lives and, and help them to recover in this. I pray for our brother John Leo, Lord, that you would just watch over him, Lord, as he's going through his therapy, Lord, and just be with these and be with all of our church members. Be with all of them, Lord. We're praying that you give them that strength and that peace and that comfort that only you can get. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, this is a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, I can't wait till we're in here together on Wednesday nights and worshiping together. It, it just, I can, I'm looking forward to it. It's, it's, it's hard to preach to an empty, empty church. I know there's people at home and there's watching it on Facebook and I've got to see all the teachers and, and I enjoy that. That's one thing I enjoy is, is watching each one of the teachers get up and, and uh, break bread and, and just teach. They're, they're, they're all different, but yet they're all gifted by God. And, and, uh, and it's just a privilege to, to watch those and, and to have that access at home. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about something that's very important, probably one of, the, one of the most essential things that we can do as church members, as, as Christians, as believers. And, and Pastor Bobby just uh, opened up with this not knowing where where we're going, but he he talking about prayer. I want to talk essentially about the power of prayer. 
because F.B. Meyer, uh, the author of, a, of his book, The Secret Guidance, said that the tragedy of life is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. Let me, let me repeat that. I want you to get this. The tragedy of life is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. See, in, in churches and, and around the world, prayer is talked about more than anything else. And it's practiced less than anything else. And I, 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 I like to pray. But, you know, I, I'll say, brother, I'm going to pray for you. And I'll forget sometimes. Or I'll sit there and I'll do everything I, can, I think of. And then the last, I, I, I forget that I need to start with prayer. And that's me. I'm a preacher. I'm, I know God's word. And I, I, I've been had a relationship with him. But, you know, sometimes we'll get off and we'll get carried away on things and forget to talk to the one that is in control of all things. That is in charge. The maker of, of you and I. The one who redeemed us. The one who paid a price to, to purchase us. And that, that brings us availability. Matter of fact, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, it says, Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Let us come boldly unto the throne of grace. To come boldly to the throne of grace. God has granted us access through his son. See, see if, you, if you trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and, and, and you know him, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. And it's only through him do we have that access. And we could come boldly with our petitions. We could come boldly with our requests. We could intercede on behalf of our, our, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we could intercede on behalf of those that are lost and don't know him yet. We could go to him in prayer. See, here's the thing. God doesn't need you and I. He doesn't need us. But in his sovereign grace, God allows us through his good pleasure uh, to, he has chosen to involve you and I through our prayers to accomplish his will he, he's chosen to use us see I used to have this on, on my desk and, and it says and this is what it says it says without him I can't without me he won't He's, he's, there's things in this world that aren't done because people haven't prayed for it. There's things that have been done because people haven't prayed. Hey, Lord, could you please stop this? Man. He's allowed it to go on. He's allowed these things to occur. And he, he chooses to use us in our prayer to make us a part of it, to just come and, and to sit on his lap spiritually. And I want to talk tonight just why our prayer matters why our prayers matter you know uh i'm reminded and, and i've used this a few times but in a one of my favorites about prayer is luke chapter 11 and verse number one it says and it came to pass that as jesus was praying in a certain place when he ceased one of his disciples came and said lord teach us to pray teach us to pray. They watched Jesus praying and talking and communing with the Father. And they saw him doing that time after time. And here they watched him this night in particular. And they asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. That's the, that's the, if you look in the scripture, it does, they don't ever ask him, teach us to preach. Lord, teach us to heal. Lord, teach us to, to bring back people from the dead. Or, or you know, something cool. I would have probably said, Lord, could you teach us to walk on water? But, you know, they didn't do that. They say the only thing that's recorded that them asking Lord teach us to do is to teach us to pray because it's important. Our prayers matter. Lord, teach us to pray. Now, in Jeremiah, one, one who, who mentions this in Jeremiah 33, Jeremiah says 33, th verse 3, so it's 333, three, three threes. It says, call unto me, he says, and I will answer thee. And I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Call unto me and I'll answer. And I'll show you great things that you don't know. 
You know, why are we not seeing great things done in the cause of the Lord? Because we've not called on Him. Because we've not looked to Him to, to ask Him, Lord, Lord, what, what, what do you want to do? Lord, I just want to be about your business. Lord God, Lord, cr creating me a clean heart. Renewing me a right spirit. David prayed. You know, and you know, and then when that happens, when you confess your sins and you come to him in prayer, you know, you then you say, Lord, I want to I want to be a light into this world. You pray to, for him to use you as a tool. And you know he will. He will back it up just a couple of chapters. Actually, chapter 29 of our pastor's favorite verse is 29, 11. Which is good. It says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. But right after that, in verse 12, he says this. Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go, go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And you seek me, you shall seek me and find me, when you shall search for me with all of your heart. Do we want to just sit down in God's presence and get to know Him? I know a lot of times we treat God like a vending machine or the proverbial Santa Claus. You know, we, we say, God, here's, here's, here's my list. This is what I want done. If you could uh, get me a new car, a wife, and uh, let's make sure you could uh, settle these things here for me and work it out. We'll be good. And then you say, okay, bye, Lord. He wants us to come and ask him things, but you know, he, he wants us to see our need. And, and, and we find in scripture, matter of fact, in Matthew 7, 7, I, I want to go there and, and read it. It says, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. So he tells us to ask, to seek, and to knock. He tells us to do those things. And I think it's important that we do. See, God wants us to ask him, why do our prayers matter? Why are they important? I want to look just a few things here in, in God's word. And the, the first thing I want to look at is that God governs in response to our prayers. God governs in response to our prayers. And you know, we see that first in Genesis 18. Well, it's not first, but I want to first look at Genesis 18. Uh, this is a familiar scripture to many. Uh, it's when God and two angels visit Abraham on the plains of Mamre, where, where it speaks of fatness and, and uh, it speaks of a place of fellowship. And matter of fact, you read that they eat a meal together and it's just a, an awesome meal they have. And it says it in verse 16 of, of uh, verse chapter 18, it says, And the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them, to bring them on the way. See, I like that right there. I wasn't even going to say that much about that. But it says they went to, they had a mission. They were going to go and check out Sodom. But it says, and Abraham went with them. See, and that's part of prayer. We need to get into God's presence. Matter of fact, God says, be still and know that I am God. Matter of fact, in, in uh, Proverbs chapter 3, uh, verse uh, 6 and 7, it says, uh, trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. Acknowledge him in all of your ways. What does that mean? Look to him in all the things you do. Look to him for leadership and guidance. Look to him for, for what steps you need to take. Acknowledge him in all thy ways, and he shall direct thy paths, the Bible tells us. But here, here Abraham is, and it, it says that he went with him. And, you know, it I goes on down and, and he says, and the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham, verse 17, that which I, I, I plan on doing? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him. I like that. He knows us. He knows you and I. And he says, And I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord. Wow, that's awesome. And, and, and to do justice and judgment, and the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. That verse right there, verse 19, I, 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 just, I just read it in passing, but now as I'm up here standing before you, that's pretty powerful stuff. It says, Abraham, I, 
I know him. He's going to teach his children what they should do. And it says right here, I like this. It says, to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. And here's the same thing. You can say that about you and I as Christians. We are to do justice. We are to, to do judgment. And, we're, and God's going to use us. And he uses each and every one of us in a way, in a mighty powerful way, to, to usher in what he's bringing forth, that harvest that our pastor talked about just a second ago. Uh, he's, he's using us to go out into the fields. He's using you and I as, you know, he talked about last summer. You know, last summer's over. Last summer, there's been a lot to come to know Jesus last summer. There's in last fall and even early January. But, you know, there's still, the harvest now is even more ready. It's even more ready. And we need to be able and willing to, to get on our knees and praise God. Burden my soul, Lord God, that I may be a, a, a witness for you, Father God. We need to be praying that prayer. And we need to be seeking his face. Because you know what Abraham's doing right here? He's getting ready to know what God's getting ready to do. He's, or God said, I'm getting ready to go down and check out Sodom. Because its wickedness has come up before me. Matter of fact, verse 23, he said, uh, or verse 22, he says, And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. But look at this. It said, But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Abraham was standing before the Lord. That's, that's the thing. We need to come boldly into his presence. We need to come boldly before the throne room. We can do that. And we need to be in a position where we stand before the Lord. Abraham was doing that right here. And then it goes on and it says this. And Abraham drew near. It says he's standing before the Lord. But now it says he drew near. I think he leaned in a little closer. And you know, if, if Jesus is living inside of you, I've heard this, you can't get any closer. Oh, yes, you can. You could get a cl closer by your, by your affection. You could get closer by your attention. You could get closer by you looking upon him. See, the Bible says you can't serve two masters. You know, a lot of times, who's your master? Maybe it's Netflix. Uh, I was talking with somebody about how many shows I've watched on Netflix the last few weeks. <laughs> The last few months, I guess you could say. I watched a few. But, you know, who's, who's my master? Does that master my life? Does, or does the Lord master my life? But here, here Abraham, he got near. It says he drew near and he said, Wilt thou also destroy the wickedness? Here's where Abraham starts praying with the Lord. He starts pleading with the Lord. Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? He knew that his nephew Lot was down there in Sodom. And he knew that it was important to pray. So he said, peradventure, there be 50 righteous, 50 righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy the city? At first, you know, I think Abraham was thinking there's 50, eight, Lot's been there for quite some time. So he's probably influenced 50 people. I want to ask you, Lot was a carnal Christian. He didn't influence 50 people. But have you in your life influenced 50 people? That's where Abraham started right here. He started with 50, thinking, okay, surely he's been a man of God and influenced 50 people. There are 50 righteous people in Sodom. That's where he started. But as, and he, you're going to find out, eight, eight, that's where, not where Abraham stopped. So you're going to, this prayer kind of develops like this. You start going to God and you start asking things and you get in his presence and you start seeing God working in, in your life. And, and then all of a sudden Abraham's like, wait, 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 50 may not be enough. You start seeing, seeing things through, through God's perspective. And he says, so, so suppose there's 50 righteous within the city. That, are you going to destroy that place? He says in verse 25, that be far from thee, Lord, to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that by far, be far from thee, Lord, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? He's not preaching to God. He's simply pleading with God on who God is. You know, when we go to God, remind God of what he said. Remind God of who he is. Just talk to God. Talk with him. And that's what Abraham's doing. And he said, okay, I'll not destroy the city for 50's sake. And then Abraham went on. He said, oh, what if there's five less? What if there's only 45? 
Will you then destroy the city? And God said, no, I'll not destroy it for 45. Then he went on down. He went from 45 to 40. Now watch this. He goes from 40 to 30. And then from 30 to 20. And then from 20 down to 10. He's thinking, okay. The more he's sitting in God's presence, he knows he's holy and he knows he's just. And then he's thinking, okay, Brother Lot may not have done enough witnessing to win more than 10. But he's thinking when he left God. It says this. He didn't, it says in verse 33, and, and now look at this. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham. And Abraham returned into his place. So God was there talking with Abraham the whole time Abraham wanted to talk to God. When, it, when Abraham was finished, then God was God left his presence. See, God will never leave us nor forsake us, but he was listening the whole time to what Abraham was saying. And, and that, that's, he's interceding on behalf of, of his nephew Lot. But, but here, it's, it's, that's what we do to unbelievers. We intercede on their behalf. Lord, could you please save their souls? Lord, could you please do a mighty work? In Exodus chapter 17, we see, we see another incident of Moses. Moses, they, they come to, to the rest stop, or which is called ref, Rephidim, Rephidim, which means rest stop, basically. And they pitched a tent there. And it, and it turns out that this was such a dry place that they were so thirsty that they started, the people of Israel started bickering and moaning and groaning about how things are. And that's what happens when things don't work out the way people want them to. We, we, we bicker, we moan, and we complain. Now I'm saying that as church members, as a people of God, we do that. We, we've got our picture of what it ought to be, and if it don't turn out that way, we bicker, we moan, and we complain, we grumble. And that's what happens. And, uh, and, uh, and First Red Bank Baptist Church, I love you. I really do. And I'm going to say it straight. I'm not going to, to beat around the bush. I'm not going to say things that aren't true. And, and we do that. Sometimes we get, we get in the flesh. And that's what they were doing here. They were so thirsty, they started attacking Moses. And you know, I think it was at that point that Moses called on God to refresh them. And it's good because later on in the chapter, they were getting ready to go to war. And I think God does that to you and I. He brings us to a dry time, a dry place, because he wants us to see our need and to see that we need him to refresh us. We need him, and we need him more than ever. And one of my favorite songs is, I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. Uh, and and, and uh, Holy Water, you know, that I sing that song, and there's three or four songs about that. I love those songs where you're just praying out to God, those songs where you just lift him up and you say, Lord, I need you. God, I can't make it anymore. And that's where they were at this point. And then they're going to get to where here they are. They just got the provision of water given to them, that refreshment. Now they're moving on, and in that valley it says, matter of fact, in, in chapter 17, verse 8, it says, then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Amalek, if you don't know the story, you could go back to, to Israel is Jacob, okay? Well, Amalek is Esau's great, 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 the tribe that came from Esau. Edom's one and Amalek's one. They came from descendants of Esau. And if you know, back in the beginning, Esau and Jacob struggled they strived together in, in in the womb so they were against one another now that's what's happening here they are enemies of god and moses said unto joshua in verse number nine choose out men and go out and fight with amalek tomorrow i will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of god in my hand so joshua did as moses had said to him and they went out and he fought amalek Joshua, I don't know if you know this, but uh, Amalek is a type of the flesh. And who's doing the fighting against the flesh here? Joshua. Joshua in the Old Testament is the same, Yeshua, the same name as Jesus in the New Testament. Who fights our flesh? Matter of fact, the Bible tells us we do not fight against flesh and blood. 
but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. We don't fight against the flesh. We don't fight. And there's a lot of people out there today fighting against the flesh. There's people fighting against the Republicans versus Democrats. They're out there with race wars. And that's all fighting against the flesh. But you know, all that stuff is hatred that's spread by the evil one. And that's Amalek. I'm saying Amalek because that's a type of the flesh. And, and, and here, here we are. It says this. It says, go, up to, go out and fight. And Joshua went out and Moses did as, as he said. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. I found my place. There we are. Verse 10. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hands that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hands, Amalek prevailed. You know, that's, that's a spiritual picture of prayer. Matter of fact, 1 Timothy 2.8 says, I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. Paul said that in 1 Timothy to Timothy. I will that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. That's what Moses was doing. He was praying. He was interceding on behalf of the battle. He was there praying, and that was the most important part. Joshua was still down there fighting and fighting and fighting, but if he wasn't praying, Joshua wasn't winning. So he had to pray. Prayer is important. And it says, And it came to pass, in verse number 12, and But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat there on, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, and the one on the one side and the one other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. That's, that's the power of prayer. That is the power of prayer. It says his hands started getting heavy. And I promise you, there's things you're praying for, and your hands are getting heavy. You don't know how you're going to make it. You don't know it's a struggle. And it's hard. You just keep praying. The Bible says in, in Luke 18, 1, it says, men, Jesus gave a parable and he says, men are always to pray and not to faint, not to give up as some translations say. Keep praying. Uh, there's a bracelet that says push. Pray until something happens. Keep praying. Praying, pushing, pushing. Just keep coming to God and praying. Hold up your hands and keep praying to God because he's, he's wanting to do a work. Ezekiel chapter uh, 22. There it is. Ezekiel chapter 22. There's a verse in verse 30. It says, here it says, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me and for the land and I should not destroy it but I found none Ezekiel's looking for somebody to stand in the gap and, and just pray to intercede to, to stand before God as a hedge to, to, to stand in the gap and pray and the, he found none it says that reminds me of Psalm 106 which, which is the story of Moses it's a it's, a, it's one of those orphan psalms that does, doesn't say who the author was. But in Psalm 106, it's, it's talking about Moses. In verse 19, it says, They made a, a calf in Horeb, and they worshipped the, the molten image. Do you remember they, they made that golden calf? Moses was up on the, on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments from God in perfect harmony with God. And while the children of Israel down there worshipping the golden calf. It says... Thus they changed the glory into the similitude of an ox that eateth grass, and forgot God their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt. They had forgotten God. And here's what it says. Wondrous works in the land of Ham, which is Egypt, and terrible things by the Red Sea. Therefore, he said that he would destroy them had not Moses, his chosen, stood before him in the breach to the gap to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. See, Jesus did that for you and I. He took on the punishment of God's sin 
of God's sin, of our sin. He took on the punishment that we deserve. God poured out his wrath on his son. But you know what? Some people are not going to accept that. And we're, at, we're as Christians to stand before them. We're to go to bridge the gap. We're to go and to send the message that we have to, to this lost and dying world. That's our responsibility. We're to go before and to call out and to pray for, for them on their behalf. I'm glad. I am so thankful for a grandmother and a mom and a dad that prayed for me. And I actually got to hear, and I told this story a number of times in this church. I heard my grandmother praying on my behalf. I was already saved. I was saved at 11 years old. But when I was in college, I'd gotten out of the habit of going to church because I had far too much going on. I didn't have time. So I was sitting there, and, and I was laying on my bed studying for school, and, and I remember hearing my grandmother calling my name out to the Lord, praying on my behalf that I get right. She said, he's a good guy. He just needs to get, get a hold of you, Lord. I pray that you get a hold of him. And you know, he got a hold of me that night. He, he, he shook me that night to hear someone praying for you. Well, that's, we need to stand in that gap and pray for, for our lost friends, for our lost family members. I have family that's lost that doesn't know Jesus as the Lord and Savior. I, I want to pray for them. I want to stand in that gap for them. In Nehemiah, we see that uh, here in Nehemiah chapter 1, Nehemiah gets word of what has taken place in verse number 4. Uh, he gets word that the, the walls of Jerusalem were broken down and the gates were on fire, and, and he was just heartbroken. It says in verse 4, it says, And it, it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept. Now, I know there's things in your life that's caused you to just sit down and weep. There's turmoil. There's, there's, there's troubles that come on you that you can't do anything but sit down and cry. Well, that's what, that's what Nehemiah did. He started out and he sat down and he wept, it said. And it goes on. It says, And he mourned certain days. And he fasted and he prayed before God, the God of heaven. That's what Nehemiah did. Nehemiah, it says, it goes on and here's his prayer. It says, and I beseech thee, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and terrible or awesome God that keepeth covenant and mercy for for them that love him and observe his commandments, let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night. For the children of Israel, thy servants, and, thou, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned. He didn't say they have sinned. He said we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments of the statutes nor thy judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee. Okay, he's asking God to remember. You know, I don't think God's, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, God, God knows. But he's saying, remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But ye if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, <laughs> that's big, if you turn unto me, keep my commandments and do them, that though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now there are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thy ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and to prosper I pray thee, thy servant, this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was 
the king's cupbearer. Here, Nehemiah was the one that went before the king and tasted the, the wine to see if it was poison. And taste, you know, I kind of like that job because, you know, he's, he's drinking the king's drink. He's getting to taste the king's food. Uh, I know Pastor Bobby kind of does that sometimes with his kids and anybody can really. Uh, he'll eat off somebody else's plate. I mean, that's, that's, he's checking it out, see if it's poison. I mean, that's, that's a good thing that he does that. Uh, and I, I commend him for that, just as long as it's not mine. Uh, but uh, here, here, Nehemiah, his plan to, re to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem come in a response and prayer and fasting. That's what happens. Things happen or things don't happen because of prayer. It's important. So secondly, uh, God releases his grace and his power when we pray. There's called intercession. You know, I mentioned Abraham interceding, Moses interceding. Uh, intercession is simply this. It's acting between, or, or between two parties. It's begging on behalf of another. You know, you, you have people that intercede on your behalf. They're begging on behalf of another. And you know who intercedes on our behalf? Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's his ministry right now. He is praying on our behalf to the Father. He's interceding for us. The Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf. There's times we don't know what to pray. We could just sit there and cry. You know the Lord prays for us. He does. In uh, Luke chapter 11, I was there just a few minutes ago, but down on down in verse 5, here's a good picture of, it, of, of one who's interceding. In verse 5, it says, And he said unto them, Jesus did, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. No. He says, I say unto you, Though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of the importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. See, that's, that's a picture of interceding. That's a picture of going in on someone else's behalf. See, James chapter 5, verse 16 tells us how to pray. It's, it tells us in, in James 5, 16, uh, this, is, this, is, this is good. It says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much the effectual fervency of prayer getting on your knees the basically like birthing a child the the labor pains you you're fervent you're you're going at your you're going after you're praying with fervency sorry i spit on someone no one's there we're good um so the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man you know this that last part availeth much it availeth much. See, God will release his grace and his power through prayer. He chooses to do that. As we go and we look in John 14, which is uh, next, next book over, next chapter 2, we see, a, we see a story here that I want to look at. Uh, actually, Jesus is talking to his disciples uh, the night of his going to be the next day he's crucified his last night on earth uh, alive uh, until he comes again R raises from the dead of course but here he is before he goes to the cross he says verily verily I say unto you he that believeth on me the works that I do shall he do also and greater works than these shall he do because I go unto the father see what that says is intercession is the key to great works. God will do great things. He says in Jeremiah, I want to do great and mighty things, which you know not. He wants to do those things uh, on our behalf. Prayer, we see in, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, we were there just a second ago in verse 8, but 2 Timothy chapter 2, um, it says in verse number 1, I exhort therefore the first of all 
supplications, that's prayers, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. We need to pray for all men, he tells Timothy. But look at this next part here. For kings. Really? He's telling Timothy to pray for a king that's probably going to feed many Christians to lions? Yep. He's telling him to. But you know, we live in a world, if you don't like him, you, you hate him and you want, you want bad things to happen. Really? If you're un, in that boat, do you want to throw rocks? Uh, it, don't throw rocks if you live in a glass house. But, you know, the, no matter whether it's a Republican or Democrat as president, we need to pray for him. That God tells us through Paul for us to pray for kings, for all them that are in authority. You don't like your boss? It's not to, to, to wish bad things on him because that's going to affect you. Pray for him. Pray for your enemies. If you don't like them, pray for them. Pray for all those, your kings, all those that are in authority. It says this, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in godliness and honesty. So we are to pray for those that, that all men, it says, but especially those in power, for, for, our, for our mayors, for, for our, our principals of schools, if you're in school, for our teachers. For, we're to pray for our boss at work. We're to pray for one another, but we're especially to pray for them as well. So, because prayer transforms. Now, and then one of the most important things is we probably started out that, that I feel right now is prayer is, gives the power to save people. People are saved through our prayers. God uses us to, to bring other people to the Lord through our prayers. We need to pray for one another. John 17 and verse number uh, 20 goes out and it says here, let me read it. It says, neither pray I for these alone, Jesus was saying, for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Jesus prayed for them, for you and I, back when he was getting ready to be crucified. He didn't just pray for his disciples there, but he prayed for you and I, for all those that are going to believe on him. So, so prayer is essential for those that are being saved. Romans 10.1 tells us uh, clearly that, uh, let's turn there. It says in Romans 10.1, it says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Paul was saying his heart's desire and his prayer was for Israel that they might be saved. So here Paul's praying for Israel. Jesus was praying for all believers. But you, you know, we find in 1 Timothy 2 and verse number 4, we were just there, Coach Kid, you should have saved. But here it says in verse 4, it says, Who will all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth? That's what Paul's desire, that's what God's desire is for us. Let's go back and read one again. I exhort, therefore, that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made unto all men for kings and for all that are in authority. And in verse 3 it says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what he desires. And that's what we need to pray for. for we, we need to go after him. We need to pray, Lord, Lord, sick them. You know, basically, you know, just come about them. Convict their hearts, Lord. Move in a mighty way that they see their need for a Savior. And, you know, in uh, my sixth point, and uh, it just worked out that way, is that prayer defeats Satan. We see, and I read this earlier, but we see, and uh, Paul tells him to the church of Ephesus, he says, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, he says, Take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day 
having done all to stand. And then it lists the armor there. It lists, you know, having your uh, loins girt about with truth, having your on the breastplate of righteousness, the, your feet shod in the preparation of the peace. Uh, and then he says, and, and above all, taking the shield of faith, which you shall be able to resist the, the fiery darts of the wicked. And he says, take on the helmet of salvation. And, and then the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And then right after this, he says this, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So we're not only to pray always, but we're also to watch. We're to be watchful and to look out for things. I think we get so caught up in living and making a living rather than looking and watching for what God needs us to pray. That watchman that, that, that Ezekiel talks about or that one that's going to stand in the gap. We need to be that person. We need to see one another as God sees us. You know, there's people we come in contact with every single day, unless you're staying at home quarantine and it's just your wife or your husband or whatever. You're going to see people that need the Lord. They're all over here. And there's more today than there's ever been lost people in this world. More lost people than there has ever been that need Jesus. And we need to go in before them. You know, G Jesus prayed for Peter uh, in Luke chapter 22. He says, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan is desired to have you. Satan wants you. If you're listening to me, and, the, and Satan wants you right now. He's desired to have you. But if he can't, you know what it says? That he may sift you as wheat. Here's what Jesus said. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen your brethren. Satan wants you and I. He, you know, but no weapon formed against us can prosper. Uh, and I heard this, this week how a, a major in the, the Navy, or I don't know if that's right, but a, a officer in the Navy had to, had to uh, get court-martialed because they had that on their computer screen and wouldn't take it off. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. See, prayer helps us defeat Satan. And you know what? Prayer brings about revival. Prayer does just that in Colossians chapter 4. And I'm going to close and turn it over to Pastor Bobby. Just this last verse here. Colossians chapter 4. We see in verse number 2. Paul tells us to continue Coloss the church of Colossians, which us as well, to continue in prayer and watch, there it is again, in the same with thanksgiving. With all, praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also at bonds. So here is Paul telling them to pray for him, pray for us, that God would open up a door of utterance, that we could speak God's word. We could speak the mystery of Christ. And that's what we need to pray for one another, that God would have you and I to go out into this world and be witnesses, that I could pray for, for this church, for each and every one of you. Pray for individual names. I ask you to pray for me that I could be a light, that I could have that, that utterance to, to, to have the opportunity to speak to someone about Christ. You know, it goes on here. It goes in verse number 12. I'm skipping a few verses, but in verse number 12, we see that Epaphras, who is one of you, Paul says, a servant of Christ, saluteth you always. It says, laboring fervently. There's that word again, fervent. For you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. So here's a guy actually praying for the church to have revival. He's praying for the, the people of Col Col the Colossians. I'm not going to, I can't say it. So here we go. He's praying for them to have revival, to be able to stand before God. To, you know, that's, that's to be revived. See, I put, I put a thing here, a little quote. 
There's never been a spiritual awakening in any country or locality that did not begin in united prayer. You know, I was reading today about how when this country first started, people had actually given up on church. There were a lot of people quitting church. Harvard was, uh, people were actually taking Bibles and, and burning them. They were kind of giving up. They were at a low point right before it started. And uh, preacher Jonathan Edwards had received a message and, and got inspired about getting on his knees and praying. And, and, uh, and he prayed and, and the church broke out in revival. The church started praying and everyone started praying. And our nation had a revival. That's what we need to do as church members is to pray to get on our knees, to pray for those that are lost. And to die and to pray for one another, to stand the gap, to be intercede, to intercede on their behalf. I'm going to close this in a word of prayer, and I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Bobby. Father God, we thank you for your word. God, we love you. We thank you for you giving your life for us that we can have everlasting life, that we can come into your presence, God, that you've given us the gift of prayer, that we can come and bow before you and and seek your face, Lord God, and, 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 and see what we need to do, Lord, but more importantly, to, just to, to have fellowship with you, to commune with you, to come into your presence, that you want to commune with us, God, more than we even want to commune with you. God, give us that desire to come into your presence. God, give us a desire to, to have that revival in our life, a revival of your presence in our life, God, because if, you, if we seek your presence, if we come into your presence, Lord God, then and that will give us the, the desire to go out into to, to this lost world and share the, your message. God, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to close this out here and I didn't have a mic ready but uh, I feel the need to do that I want to go back to a couple of things that uh, brother Ralph covered the whole Bible on prayer I had a couple of them here and I'm gonna go back and hit on them again just because they they came to me and then he spoke about it but I want to show you something real quick if I can you know, years ago they took prayer out of school. Years ago they they uh, took prayer out of meetings and places. And, and Paul went to the people, the Thessalonians. He went to their Thessalonica. He went there to talk with them. And he said there in, in chapter 1, he said, We always thank God for all of you mentioning you in our prayers. We continuously remember before our God and Father, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, for we know brotherly love by God that has been, he has chosen you because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with the power and with the Holy Spirit of deep conviction. And that's what it is. It's that deep conviction. It's that Holy Spirit that causes me and gives me the desire that I pray day and night for our flock. I pray for those of you. I, I'm concerned about you. And I hope you're praying for me. And I hope we're praying for each other. And we need our leaders to pray for each other. But let's go to you and I. Let's go to you and I. Another scripture that was mentioned, and it's this. In Ephesians, uh, the Apostle Paul once again in Ephesians chapter, chapter 6, he said, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power, not my strength. Not my power, because I have none. 
Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. The devil knows how to reach in. The devil knows how to reach in and get to you and to get to me. He knows the things about us. He has a game plan about us. He watches us. And that's his desire, to destroy our spirit and destroy our happiness. But Paul says, look, put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, so when the day of evil does come, when this day comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, after you have done everything, to stand, stand firm. Tonight, I don't know where you're at, in your life, I don't, I don't. But you know where you're at. You know the situations. You, you heard the message that, that our brother preached. Have you been praying? Have you been praying about situations? I've got a couple of things in my life that, that I've prayed a little bit about, but I haven't got to praying where I need to. The message hit me. I need to pray a little bit more about a couple of things that are going on. But you know what? All of us, we could increase our prayer time. And I'm asking you tonight to do that. I'm asking you to pray for our country. I'm asking you to pray for the leaders of our country and for all the people and all the confusion that's going on in the world right now. I'm asking you to pray for that, that God will heal our land. They'll heal this situation because there's a lot of confusion and God is not the author of confusion but peace, love, and understanding. I'm asking if you'll pray for that tonight. I'm asking you if you'll pray for all the churches all over our world and here in our country that they'll open back up, that God's Spirit will come in and dwell and that we will grow spiritually in the Lord and physically in numbers that will lead people to the Lord. I'm asking that you do that. Now I'm going to talk personally real quick and I'm almost finished. Where's your prayer life tonight? I'm talking to you as individuals. Where's your prayer life? To have a relationship with God, we, we read His Word and that's Him talking to us. But we have to talk back. In a relationship, there has to be communication. Are you where you need to be in your prayer life? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? That's the question. As the music plays, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray right now that there's decisions that are being made. Right now, Lord, if there's someone that does not know you, I pray that they're asking you to come into their life and be Lord of their life. Lord, if there's someone out there right now that, Lord, they're going through health problems and Lord, they've not been praying, they've not been talking to you about this. They don't have that comfort and that peace that, that they just connect up with you. Maybe it's financial problems that just connect up with you. Maybe it's a loved one that they know that don't know you as Lord and Savior, that they just connect up with you. <coughs> Lord, I'm praying right now that all those people that are listening will connect up with you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I've enjoyed tonight, and I want to remind you again, we're going to have Sunday school this Sunday morning starting at 10 o'clock. And then we'll have a worship service. Uh, when you come in for Sunday school, uh, we're, we're still doing the, the seating, the, uh, you know, staying apart, the social distancing. We have the seats marked off. You know where they're at. 
I'm asking if you're in the adult class and you come in up here that you will go ahead and take the seat where where you've been sitting uh, through this time period. I know it may be a little different for you, but if you will, because the kids will be down downstairs and then we'll come back together at 11 o'clock. We'll all be together for the worship service. I'm looking forward to being with you. And I hope you're looking forward to it. Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. And the people said, Amen. There's a few of them said that. I hope you did out there. Psalms 150 and verse 6 says, If you're breathing, you need to be praising. So get your hands up real high. One, two, three. Praise the Lord.